The 22nd Sunday after Trinity, the call like, Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the church, in continual godliness, that it may, through thy protection, be free from adversities and oppressions of unbelievers. We especially pray for those children who will die tomorrow at the hands of the genocidalists in this wicked nation. Enable us to speak and to serve you and to be your agents, salt and light, to the glory of thy holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 4 of hymn 290 for Thanksgiving Day, written by Dean Henry Elford, the famous Greek scholar, Dean of Canterbury, buried at St. Martin's. 1810 to 1871. Also tore down some historic buildings that irritated some later architecturalists, historians of architecture. He, he, Dean Alford said, oh, they were kind of useless buildings, but they were ancient historic. Anyways, he's famous for his poetry, but also his Greek scholarship. Even so, Lord, quickly come to thy final harvest home. Gather thou thy people in, free from sorrow, free from sin. Therefore, ever purified in thy presence to abide. Come with all thine angels, come, raise the glorious harvest home. He also wrote that infamous and famous hymn, 10,000 times 10,000. Wow. Well, we're with Dr. Wilhelm Muncher who lived 1766 to 1814. Oh, his uh, elements of dogmatic history. He was a professor of theology, a doctor, STD, at Mark. Translated by James Murdoch, published in New Haven in 1830. United States had had a constitution for 41 years. The Brits had been in Washington, D.C., bombing it, 1812. So this is very early, no doubt. New Haven, Yale College. Um, preliminary stuff. Thank God for Google. Author's preface. This elementary work is intended primarily for use in the author's lectures and was especially calculated to aid his hearers, yet it may perhaps be serviceable to others by presenting to them a rapid glance over the whole field of dogmatic history. The principles on which it is drawn are the same as those followed by the author in his Elements of Church History. And as he, expl he has explained there, those principles in the preface will not repeat them here. It was his great object to give a plain, simple, and dense statement. Therefore, only three periods of time are assumed. And the facts are recapitulated in so unconstrained a manner that uniformity in the mode of treating several periods was intentionally disregarded. The facts also are rather indicated than fully displayed. The author flatters himself, however, that the discerning will perceive a fixed plan running through the work and will understand that a different mode of treating the successive periods arose from the effort to give the exact mode of thinking and reasoning in each. In the first period, the passages from the fathers, which might serve as vouchers, are with few exceptions omitted, and the reader is referred to the author's manual for them. In the second period also, the passages in the scholastic writers are but seldom pointed out because they could be of little service to beginners, and because those who are acquainted with these writers can easily find the passages, their systems having generally the same arrangement. Yet, wherever the experience would be at a loss to determine on what authority an assertion rests, the passage is expressly named. 
<clears throat> in the third period, a greater number of citations was necessary, and the author confesses that he has often doubted whether too many or too few were introduced. It has always been his rule, however, in making the selections of authorities to regard the historical value and not the doctrinal importance of passages. The author wishes that intelligent judges, if they deem the worth 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 examining would acquaint, acquaint him with defects. Translator's preface. The work here offered to American theologians is supposed to be like anything that has ever appeared before the English public. It is an outline of general history of the Christian faith with copious references to authorities and authors. It is an outline merely, not a full history, for it mentions only general facts and states them in a most concise manner. It was designed to be the text merely on which a lecturer might expatiate. <clears throat> it is a general history, that is, one that covers the whole subject of dogmatic theology or systematic divinity, and not a history of one or of a few particular doctrines only. It is purely a history, for the author did not design to discriminate between true and false doctrines, to elucidate, confirm, and recommend the former, and to confute and set a mark upon the latter. He aims to be a mere historian of facts, or to narrate truly and candid candidly what doctrines were discussed and how they were stated, defended, and attacked, and by whom without laboring to prepossess the reader either for or against the doctrine. In other words, he professes to assume the attitude of a witness in a court whose duty it is to state the whole truth and nothing but the truth without regarding the interests of either of the litigating parties and not the part of an advocate whose office it is to defend his client and the best interest that the case will admit. This mode of composing dogmatic histories, it is believed, will be altogether new to most theologians in this country. For all the histories written previously to the middle of the last century, and all written since in the English language, whether they were histories of particular doctrines, as those of the Trinity, infant baptism, the Lord's Supper, predestination, free grace, or the histories of all the doctrines in a systematic theology were manifestly written for the express purpose either of confirming or confuting a particular creed. And that's fine. We'll insert that. And of course, the writers not only collect all the testimonies they can, they can on one side and make most of them, and enumerate some on the opposite side, placing them in the most unfavorable unfavor light. But they resort to all the arts of rhetoric and logic to persuade their readers to adopt the positions they defend, blah, blah, blah. Of this character is Dr. Priestley's history of the corruptions. Just a second. Uh, Priestley's history of the corruptions. He was a, a Dr. Bull took him on. And also the histories of the Trinity by Christopher Sandus, Dr. Alice, Bishop Bull, and others. And the history of infant baptism by Wall, Gale, Robertson, and numerous others. The work, this work is a history of the faith of such as have borne the Christian name or of their speculative belief. Okay. The author of this work, Dr. William Muncher, was born at Hurstfield on the 11th of March, 1766, became a stated preacher in the cathedral church in his native place till the age of 26 when he was made professor in ordinary in the University of Marburg in Hesse-Kassel 
and consistorial counselor there for 22 years till his death. July 1814, he composed the preface to a popular edition of Luther's Bible and a volume of printed sermons which are said to be characterized by their religious fervor and by the constant and happy use made of the Holy Scriptures. He was also the principal conductor of a journal devoted to the interests of schools and religion. But his great and most noted work, Manual of Dogmatic History, four volumes, extending over the first six centuries. Besides these, he composed an elementary church history, and the work is here presented of the public. The author has happily combined the chronological order with that relation of things, and the whole work is distinguished alike for the preserving, learned, and critical industry manifested in collecting the materials. The theological sentiments of Dr. Muncher, the translator, regrets that he is not able definitively to state, since the knowledge of them might serve to show where and how the author's prepossessions were likely to mislead him. With several passages of this work, as of the manual, the translator thought he discovered indications of much laxer views in theology than his own. Yet he supposes Dr. Muncher was classed by his countrymen with Michaelis, Doderlein, and Planck, and others who stood on the middle ground between the ancient pure Lutheranism and the modern neology of Germany. After all, the private opinions or commendations and censures of the writer which occasionally escaped from him unconsciously, ought not to influence the reader, blah, 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 New Haven, 1830. The middle ground between pure Lutheranism and German neology, 1830. Content, doctrines, change in doctrines, dogmatic history, use sources, laws, literature. The early ages, 1 to 600, the general history, Jesus Christ, apostles, church, creed, received theology, estimation of the Bible, use of the Bible, tradition, philosophy, theologians, origin, religious controversies, systems of theology, decline of theological learning, history of particular doctrines, kingdom of Christ, chiliasm, resurrection, gross theory opposed, Intermediate state, purgatory, hell, and the damned church, unity, marks of the church. Doctrine of angels and devils, chapter 3, the truth of Christianity. Tax on pagans, evidences, prophecy, external proofs, objections, neglect of apologetics. Being in character of God, proof, existence, unity, nature, attributes, creation, providence and theodicy, the Trinity, Unitarians, Trinitarians, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement, and Origen, <coughs> Dionysius, Alexandria, Dionysius, Rome, Arian Controversy, Nice, Council of Nice, Consequences, Arian Parties, Marcellus, Photinus, Athanasius, Triumph, Subsequent Statements, the Person of Christ, Nature, Nestorius, and Cyril, Council of Ephesus, yeah, this is an outline, all right. Redemption, doctrine of church, nature of man, origin, propagation of sin, Greek fathers, Latin fathers before Augustine, early doctrine concerning sin, controversy of Augustine with Pelagius, sin, grace, free will, election, three, the doctrine after Augustine, what Christ has done for men, effects of Christ's death. Sacraments, baptism, infant baptism, baptism of heretics, Lord's Supper, Lord's Supper is a sacrifice, presence of Christ in the Eucharist, sacraments in general. Middle Ages, 600 to 1517, general history. Theology of the Greeks, John of Damascus, Greek theology, state of theology among the Latins, Charlemagne, Preparatory Steps to Scholasticism, Anselm, Hildebert, Philosophic Theology, Advances of Scholastic Theology, 
influence of monastic orders, the later scholastics cause of the downfall of scholastic theology, history of particular doctrines, God, creation, angels, providence, Christ, man, resurrection, development of doctrines not before defined, procession of the Holy Spirit, sin and grace in the Greek church, Latin church, scholastics on sin, sinless conception of Mary, grace, predestination, redemption, faith, adoration of saints and Mary, sacraments, Baptism, confirmation, Lord's Supper, transmutation, contest with Berengarius. Scholastics and canonists, consequences of the doctrine of transubstantiation, the mass, penance, indulgences, extreme unction, ordination, marriage, departed souls. That's all done in like two, three pages. Third period, modern times, 15, 8, 17 to 1800. Causes of the modifications, Reformation, Protestant systems, reaction upon Catholic Church, completion of Lutheran consistent variations in the doctrine of the Reformed Church, attempts of the Reformed to improve their theology, achievements of Spener in regard to Lutheran theology, Wolfian philosophy, Protestant theology out of Germany, Influence of Kantian philosophy, theology of other churches, history of particular doctrines, foundation of all religion and Christian religion in particular, God, providence, immortality, revelation, revelation, miracles and prophecies, recent views in Germany. Well, that should be fun. The Trinity views of modern German divines, it should be good. Creation, angels, Christ, hereditary sin, grace, continuation, further disagreement in the Reformed churches respecting these doctrines. History of these doctrines in the Catholic Church, influences of the Word of God, redemption, justification, faith, and works. Common doctrine of the Protestants respecting the Lord's Supper dissension among Protestants during Luther's life, resurrection, salvation, and damnation. Writers, Christian Father Walsh, thoughts on history of religious opinions, doctrines. By the word doctrines, the ancient writers un understood sometimes religious truths in general and sometimes the theoretical principles of Christian religion in opposition to practical precepts. The word has been used to denote explanations and opinions respecting religious truths. The modern use of the term makes it equivalent to articles of faith, received doctrines, kirklike dogmen, are those which are admitted by some in the entire community. Changes in regard to doctrines. The Christian doctrines have undergone innumerable changes since their first appearance in regard to the matter of them, the manner of stating and defending them, the degree of importance attached to them, and the arrangement and exhibition of them. <clears throat> the causes of these changes are to be traced to the diversities of genius and education among Christians, especially among the teachers, and to the peculiar circumstances and necessities of the church in different ages. The constitution of the church, the freedom of opinion, the state of learning, have ever had great influence in shaping the articles of faith. The Christian faith, like every other branch of knowledge, has both its external and internal history. The former, with respects to the, mo the mode of arranging and exhibiting articles of faith, is called the history of dogmatics. The latter, which states the revolutions and the various articles of faith, is called dogmatic history. Both, however, so run into each other that it may be expedient to combine them. The dogmatic history, which this is, may either embrace all ages and all articles of faith, or may be limited in one or both respects. Strict partiality and truth and a judicious selection 
and instructive development of the facts must ever be put first. Note, it is a question whether dogmatic history should detail the doctrines inculcated by Christ and the apostles or confine itself to the received doctrines of the church. Value of dogmatic history. The uses of dogmatic history are that it is indispensable to the attainment of a thorough knowledge and correct judgment of systematic theology that it teaches us to distinguish the original Christianity from the subsequent spurious additions and corruptions, that it serves to awaken and animate a spirit of inquiry, that it promotes liberality, moderation, and independence, that it warns us against the perversions of Christianity in the past ages. It likewise affords the mind high intellectual pleasure to contemplate in the mirror of history the efforts and struggles of men after clearness and solidity of views on religious subjects in which both dependence and the independence of mind are clearly seen. And he's got a few references here. Sources. The sources from which dogmatic history must be drawn are not indeed equally copious and lucid in every period yet they are considerably numerous and rich in all periods. Among them, the public confessions of faith, the decrees and acts of ecclesiastical councils, the writings of persons in high authority in the church, and the public liturgies hold first rank because they are public documents. Next to them must be ranked <clears throat> the writings of the Christian teachers in general, yet with discrimination, for all are not of equal authority. Likewise, the accounts of credible historians are important and useful. Use to be made of these sources. To deduce history from these sources requires extensive knowledge and great care. A discerning criticism must discriminate the spurious works from the genuine and must correct the falsified and incorrect passages which occur in works that are for the most part genuine. A good knowledge of the languages and dexterity in interpreting must disclose the meaning of a different account. Counts. Sound judgment must, without partiality, estimate the value of all statements, exclude fables and groundless conjectures, and induce caution not to infer the opinions of a writer from isolated passages of his works, nor to bend his words to a conformity with our own belief system, nor to confound the opinions of a particular writer with the general creed of the church. Civil and ecclesiastical history and the history of the sciences, particularly of philosophy and even scientific theology are necessary auxiliaries to the study of dogmatic history. Literature of John of dogmatic history. In former times, dogmatic history was either neglected or occasionally touched upon in treatises on theology in ecclesiastical histories. Okay, we're going to get the German version of we're the best, right? Started here in Germany. We just saw that in uh, Bernard Lowe's, that history didn't start till the 18th century. He actually said that. Unbelievable. Bernard Lowe's, a, a historian of Luther, didn't start until the Enlightenment. He was upfront about it. Unbelievable. What else was John Strip doing? Or John Fox? John Solomon Semler was the man who especially awakened attention to its importance, and he wrote on some parts of it with acumen and independence. Afterwards, others labored to advance this branch of history. Works embracing the whole compass of dogmatic history were commenced with that design. Work by Catholics, Patavius. I don't think that's in English. Dogmata, P 
Theologica by Tomasino. Works by Protestants. Uh, Arnoldi Maltani, Manual Christian Dogma by William Muncher. That's not in English either. 18 volumes. Elements of Christian History by Augusti. Manual of Dogmatic History in Danish. Works by Unitarians. History of Corruptions of Christianity. Joseph Priestley, 1797. Works on the History of Dogmatics. J.S. Semler's Historical Introduction to Theology in German. Essay of History of the Various Methods of Teaching the Articles of Faith and in Compendiums of Theology. Ecclesiastical histories which are most valuable for historical or dogmatic theology. Caesar's Barononi, Annales Ecclesiasticus, Natalis Alexandria, Historia Ecclesiastica, James Bazania, History of the Church, two volumes. Schroek's Church History, Schmidt's Manual Christian Church History to the Reformation, Neander, General History. We're working on that. Systems of Theology, Gerhardus, Seiler, Gruner, Doderlein, Elements of Theology, Staudlin. These are all Lutherans. Method in Dogmatic Theology. Since it has been admitted that dogmatic history is not to be regarded as a mere appendage to church history or dogmatic theology, but that it deserves to be treated independently, different methods for its execution have been proposed. Some writers prefer a mere chronological arrangement, others a classification of the materials, and others again would combine both. The objects of an elementary history may perhaps be secured by assuming certain long periods of time, and our time has expired. Let us pray. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, three persons. One God be ascribed as is most justly due. All might, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Godspeed.